Usually the six of us work as a team, but tonight I had a secret mission, and I didn't want too many people around. I asked Rachel if she'd be my backup, and of course she agreed. You should see Rachel. She's like Stone Cold Steve Austin crossed with Miss Teen USA. Um... Ew. Hey, here's something we haven't had in forever. Opening book shenanigans. And since it's a Cassie book, you know it's going to be even dumber and more relevant than usual. In this case, Cassie manages to convince Rachel into helping her break into the house of Cassie's math teacher. Now, my initial thought was that they were going to steal test scores because if one of them fails the test, they'd be grounded, and that would impede on some really important missions or something. A kind of micro-moral dilemma, perhaps something that could reflect on a larger moral dilemma later in the book, justifying these old-school opening book shenanigans with a running theme. But of course, this is Cassie we're talking about. It turns out she doodled a heart with Cassie loves Jake written in it and accidentally handed it in with the test, and decided it was best to risk the well-being of herself and her best friend to retrieve it. Otherwise the teacher might, I don't know, see it, chuckle to herself, and throw it out, never bringing it up in class. Because you see, Cassie is a moron. Which is odd, because this book marks the return of Roswell High author Melinda Metz in the ghostwriting position. Her last book, number 29, The Sickness, was one of the few Cassie is not quite as big of a moron books of the series. Here it feels like they gave her an outline for a book that was meant to be published 15 or 20 books ago. Actually, this is the first of an unofficial trio of books that will share a theme of we ran out of ideas, so let's bring back something memorable from a past book. In this case, we're bringing back the characters and settings of the hork Chronicles. But Greg, you might be asking, did those events happen decades ago, and didn't most of the characters in that book die? Yes, I might be replying, but remember how many times in the past I mentioned a book where Cassie gets possessed by a ghost? Yeah, we finally reached that one. Pull out your popcorn and strap yourselves in, it's gonna be a bumpy ride. Cassie flies back to the barn in Owl Morph, but upon arriving, sees a hork hanging out right outside. Cassie's played the Animorphs Game Boy Color game, so she assumes it's just a random encounter and goes to try Claude's eyes out, only to recognize it as Jerahammy at the last minute. Yes, Cassie nearly permanently mauled and blinded an innocent hork because she forgot that the Free Colony even existed. If the Yerks knew about Cassie and wanted to attack her home, they wouldn't send in one sole hork Badger. they'd be going in guns a-blazing like they did with David. It's only the second chapter, and Cassie has already hit two home runs in Moron Baseball. Jerahammy is here to deliver a message. It seems that an Arn, the race that genetically created the hork Badger, has landed a ship in the colony, and the hork Badger need the Anors to understand what exactly is going on. An Arn on Earth? Here? Why? That's the question. What's he up to? Rachel wondered. He has to come. Star Wars The Phantom Menace isn't coming out on DVD there for like two years. He buys up a bunch of copies here, takes them home, makes a fortune. Good grief, Marco. You live science fiction. Why do you want to watch science fiction? Don't be dissing TPM, Marco said. Cool is cool. Oh, Marco. Poor sweet Marco. You'll be eating those words in time. The Animorphs arrive to the colony and meet up with Yarn, whose name is, um... Um... Yeah, let's just call him Queef. He claims to be the last surviving Arn, which means I now have to imagine him with the voice of Christopher Eccleston. When we last saw the Arn, they so didn't want to be involved with the Yerk invasion of their planet that they modify themselves to instantly die when a Yerk should try and infest them. 
Well, that turned out great, and now the last of his race, Queef, has decided to go out with a blaze of glory by using the genetic material from the free Horkbezier colony to create a clone army to fight back on the Horkbezier homeworld. Okay, the, uh, the Star Wars prequels were retroactively about the worst thing you could have brought up at this point. I have very little time, humans. No time at all for pleasantries. I will live for only 412 more days, give or take a few hours. That is a biological fact. There are forces other than biology, Axe said. He gave his deadly tail just the slightest little twitch. Jesus, Axe, where the fuck did that come from? I mean, at best, the Arn are kind of jerks, but this one specifically hasn't really done anything to justify threats of murder. Actually, Axe feels really out of character here, like Metz misinterpreted his past incidences of pride and boorishness with bullying and venom. Anyway, I guess Queef couldn't get the hork DNA on, you know, the hork homeworld, home world, so he stole a Yerk ship, which I guess was easier, and used his own technology to find the colony. But that's only half the story, because before she died, Aldrea, the Andalite-turned-Horkbezier guerrilla leader, managed to steal and hide away an entire transport ship filled with weapons and explosives, which would be the perfect way to arm Queef's clone troopers. He doesn't know where the ship is, but what he does have is Aldrea's Ixilla, a stored copy of her memories and personality, which someone else can transfer into their own mind and interact with. Naturally, there are a lot of complications to that. For reasons we'll get into in a second, the Ixilla chooses someone in a nearby area to transfer into. You can't choose ahead of time who gets it. The natural candidate is Toby, as the most intelligent hork around, and Aldrea's great-granddaughter. Rachel also steps forward, just in case. Axe isn't really considered on the grounds of being male. I guess familiar genitalia is more important in this case than familiar species. But then there's a the matter of getting rid of Aldrea when she's already in your head, and the only way to do that is for her to release her hold willingly. And if she doesn't choose to release her hold, Axe prodded, we could probably sell the story rights to Lifetime for big bucks, Marco commented. This is so television for women. Two strong, independent girls, one body. Toby turned to Axe. You only ask this because you don't trust Aldrea. As an Andalite, you mistrust anyone who would choose to permanently become hork here, she accused. Um, I'm pretty sure Aldrea never chose to be stuck in hork morph. Pretty sure she was rendered unconscious while in morph and got stuck that way. Aldrea may have learned some disgusting things about her fellow Andalites, but it wasn't enough to make her switch teams. She never really saw hork beyond tools of war, and her relationship with Dak Hammy was... Always troubled at best. I could forgive Axe thinking otherwise, since his version of the story comes secondhand from Tobias, and some of the details probably got warped in the telephone game, but Toby should know the story of her legacy by heart. And it's made no better when Cassie starts mulling over this idea like it's actually how it happened. As for the process itself, Queef nodded. He reached into a small metallic pouch hanging from a cord around his neck and pulled out a small vial. The liquid inside glowed green. Isn't that what nuclear waste looks like? Marco asked in a loud whisper. We gather to conduct the Ataf elixical, Queef began. The ceremony of rebirth is an occasion for both solemnness and joy, for grieving and celebration. He pulled the stopper out of the vial, and a wisp of vapor escaped. A moment later, the inside of my nose started to burn, although I couldn't smell anything except the odor of damp cave. We call on Aldrea Eskillion Fallen, Queef said. He reached into the pouch again. I squinted, trying to see what he'd removed. It looked like a small piece of metal. It must have been some kind of catalyst, because the instant he dropped it into the vial, the liquid turned from green to a fluorescent scarlet. Its light washed over those closest to it. Yeah, let's not beat around the bush. This is fucking voodoo shit right here. They don't even try to come up with some crappy techno-babble explanation. An alien is holding a seance in a cave so that one of them can be possessed by a ghost. I know we've had the whole science so advanced it's indistinguishable from magic thing in the past, especially with the Elemist and the Krayak, but 
A, we can actually do get a little lip service considering their abilities, and B, the Arn are no fucking Elemist. The best explanation I can figure is that the Arn created a means of transferring a person's consciousness through vapor action, which is both silly and doesn't explain why we need a ceremony for all of this shit. Of course, Aldrea ends up possessing Cassie, because it was her turn to narrate a book, and Aldrea choosing Toby would have made too much sense. It takes a while for either of them to get accustomed to sharing the same brain space and switching back and forth control. After this, every couple of chapters is narrated by Aldrea, who at least has the right level of confusion and angst for finding herself in an unfamiliar body and learning that she and everyone she loved died decades ago. As for the matter of the missing weapons... Can you help us? the Arn asked. Do you remember where the weapons are hidden? No, I know nothing of any weapons. It must have occurred, if it did occur, after, Aldrea said. I repeated her message. Remember this. It'll be important later. 